So it's amazing having Catherine Goodenough here with us today. Catherine is a principal geologist at the British Geological Survey and deputy director of BGS Global. She started her career as a mapping geologist, but has been researching critical metal resources for many years, particularly the rare earth elements and more recently lithium. So Catherine and her colleagues have been working with partners exploring lithium pegmatites across Africa. And this talk will give a summary of the current known resources plus some of the ongoing research. So thank you so much for your time, Catherine. I'm so grateful to have you here. Thanks very much, Jess. And morning, everyone. I know it's a sundowner for you, but it's seven o'clock in the morning here in Scotland. I've got no idea how I can follow Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not really going to tell any jokes. I do apologise. So um, I'll get straight into it and I'll start sharing my screen. OK, then. So um, I'd like to talk to you for a bit about um, Africa's lithium pegmatites. And this is work that I'm doing with my colleagues at BGS, particularly Richard Shaw and Ima Didi, and with Paul Nex and Judith Kinnaird from um, the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. But also working with partners from uh, geological surveys and, uh, and also mining companies and exploration companies across Africa. Uh, and some of this is done by the LIFT project, which is a research project we have funded by the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. So first of all, I guess the question that we all probably know the answer to pretty well, why lithium? Well, of course, uh, it's all about climate change, which is a, a huge global priority now. And there's the diagram from the IPCC report that's just come out showing uh, how global surface temperatures could change in a, a range of different scenarios. And bearing in mind some of the, the fires and flooding we're seeing around the world this year, with only a sort of just over one degree of uh, temperature increase since the baseline, we really don't want to be facing up to some of those higher emission scenarios with temperature rises of up to five degrees C by the end of the century. So of course, as we all know, we're going to need to uh, reduce emissions, and that means decarbonizing energy and transport. And of course, one of the ways that many of our governments, and certainly here in the UK, this is a really big thing, they're, they're changing their policy to drive a switch to electric vehicles. And uh, the diagram at the bottom there is from the International Energy Agency's Global Electric Vehicle Outlook for 2021. And it shows just how much uh, change there's been in electric vehicle stocks on our roads over the last 10 years, uh, driven particularly more than anything by China, of course, but also by Europe and to a lesser extent other countries. And of course, most of this is, um, is light vehicles for passengers. So uh, bikes, of course, in China and uh, cars in particular. And lithium ion batteries are really the main battery type that's going to be used for many years to come. For, uh, for electric vehicles. There's lots of other development going on, of course, lots of research into other types of batteries, but lithium ion batteries are definitely the leading technology. And your average lithium ion battery needs cobalt, graphite, nickel, manganese, and lithium, potentially in, in varying different quantities. But lithium is what we're gonna focus on today because lithium really is an essential component of those batteries. At the moment, you can change the amounts of nickel, manganese and cobalt, for example, but lithium is just absolutely critical. We refer to it as a critical raw material, but however you want to define critical, lithium is critical right now. And the diagram on the right there shows, uh, that's a figure from the World Bank's 2020 report on minerals for climate action. And it shows that they anticipate demand growth in lithium out to 2050, to be about five times what it is now. And I was just, just while I was waiting to talk to you there, I was actually reading an article that's just come out in Nature, talking about the fact that lithium ion batteries are going to be so important, but about potential scarcity of some of the metals and minerals we need for those batteries. And sometimes you will hear discussions about scarcity of lithium but it's just not true. You know, lithium is not a scarce element. There's an awful lot of it in the crust and indeed in brines around the world, even in seawaters. So I find it quite frustrating when we hear about lithium being discussed as scarce. It's not scarce, of course, what we do need is to be able to mine enough of it. And that's where the bottlenecks come in. 
actually getting it out of the ground. So at the moment, lithium currently comes from two main types of source, as I'm sure many of you know. The first type is the brines, the lithium rich brines, principally in the salars or salt lakes of the lithium triangle in the Andes. And also to, in some other places, the USA and particularly in China. And then the second major source is the granitic pegmatites, so the hard rock sources of lithium. And at the moment, those are, of course, particularly mined in Australia, and I'm sure many of you know more about that than I do, uh, but also in China. But granitic pegmatites that are enriched in lithium exist on every continent, of course, as we'll see in a moment. There are a range of other types of source being developed. Sedimentary rocks, so lithium enriched clays, particularly of interest at Rio Tinto's Yadar project in Serbia, uh, and also at Thaka Pass in Nevada, where Tesla has so much interest. And then geothermal brines, uh, for example, our own Cornish lithium here in the UK are looking at uh, lithium in geothermal brines circulating in the granites in Cornwall that were once mined for tin and a range of other uh, metals and minerals. So this is our map uh, that you can get from the BGS website or from Lithium Future, which is the LIFT project website. And this shows uh, all of the known um, mines and deposits of lithium around the world at the moment. Uh, the blues are the continental brines, purples geothermal brines, yellows are the uh, sedimentary or volcano sedimentary deposits, and the reds are pegmatites and granites. And bigger spots show the locations that we know to be being mined at the moment. And you can see that if you look down the, uh, the west coast of the Americas, where we've got the active volcanism, of course, We've got a lot of uh, continental brines, particularly in the salars of the Andes, but also along the west coast of the USA, where we've also got extensive volcano sedimentary deposits like Thacker Pass. If we look in the more, I guess, older stable continental crust, so in Canada, in Brazil, across much of Europe, in Australia, of course, and in parts of Africa, then granites and pegmatites dominate. And in China, there's areas where there's extensive lithium pegmatites and also areas with extensive lithium brines. And something that's very topical, you may notice, is that we don't have any spots in there in Afghanistan. Uh, but you might all have seen there's a lot of news at the moment about the potential lithium deposits in Afghanistan. And it is undeniably true, you look back through old papers written usually by Russian geologists in the 60s and 70s, and there are plenty of spodumene containing pegmatites in Afghanistan. However, of course, there's a, a tendency for the newspapers to get very excited and say, well, this is, this is what it's all about. This is what all the problem is in Afghanistan. It's all war over lithium. Um, of course, that's not true. Those lithium pegmatites in Afghanistan would just be one of the many, many spots that you see on this map. And uh, they are no more significant the many other lithium pegmatite deposits that we know around the world. So what we're going to focus on anyway for the next sort of 20 minutes or so is the lithium pegmatites in Africa. And I will give you a bit of an overview of the major projects that are developing and, um, and then look at just quickly look at some of the research that we've been doing recently. So uh, lithium in Africa. Africa does have extensive lithium resources, all in pegmatites, uh, no brines or, or sedimentary uh, lithium interest in Africa. It's the pegmatites that are most important, usually in Precambrian crust. And this map shows you some of the major projects and also shows you the transport routes that might be used uh, to take the material to be exported uh, to ports, because of course, at the moment, Africa doesn't have the sort of processing steps that would be needed. And so you would always be looking at exporting uh, mineral concentrate. We'll come back to that. So in this diagram, uh, you go from the pink, which is deposits at early stage, through the purple, orange is where they have a definitive feasibility study. And the ones in blue are actually in production. And on this map, we only show uh, Bakita in Zimbabwe, which is the only currently producing uh, lithium mine in Africa. Having said that, there's some exciting news from Arcadia in Zimbabwe, which I will come back to in a moment. Uh, but there's several others that are at that kind of stage of having reserves defined, having a DFS, 
and that includes projects in the DRC, in Mali and in Namibia, as well as in Zimbabwe. And there's several other uh, deposits that have already had quite extensive, for example, scoping studies. Uh, the white squares indicate deposits that have previously been mined for maybe tantalum or tin and have potential for lithium. And then there's a whole host of other occurrences that we haven't actually shown on this map uh, because there's maybe not that much information about them. Some parts of uh, some African countries still have very little data really on their potential resources. So when we're talking about lithium pegmatites, we're talking about igneous bodies that are usually tabular in shape. We're probably formed uh, several hundreds of meters to kilometers below the Earth's surface. Uh, but now, of course, are exposed relatively close to the surface if they're going to be mineable. Typically tens, perhaps hundreds of meters thick, very rarely hundreds of meters thick. Really, um, green bushes would be the, the major example of one that's of the largest possible scale. Uh, and typically hundreds of meters to maybe kilometers long uh, and commonly mined in, in open pits. Uh, they may have very predictable zonation. Uh, a lot of past research on pegmatites has suggested that many rare metal pegmatites have quite a predictable zonation, but lithium enriched pegmatites don't seem to be that predictable. The zonation can be very irregular. Uh, there's probably a whole completely different talk on that. And they have this whole range of really stunning textures. This is a, an example in Bikita where you can see uh, banding, directional growth of minerals. This is purple lapidolite that's showing directional growth in this photograph. Uh, graphic integrates of minerals in a very complicated texture and, and mineralogy. So one of the questions about these lithium enriched pegmatites is how they form. And that is definitely another talk. I'm only going to touch on this quickly here. But we know that pegmatites form in general where continental crust has been buried, heated, and melted. So areas where you've had metamorphism. And in fact, uh, of course, across most of uh, Australia and across much of the African continent, uh, you've had the types of conditions you need to form pegmatites, uh, particularly in our Precambrian cratonic crust. But one of the interesting questions is exactly how these pegmatites form. There's a classic model shown here as model one, which is that you have a big parental granite, uh, granite body, and that may be kilometers across. And around the margins of that parental granite, the last little bits of the most enriched magma get squeezed out into fractures and shear zones around the granite, the granite margins. And the most enriched, so lithium enriched, cesium enriched, tantalum enriched pegmatites are considered to form at a certain distance from that granite body. So they form that kind of outer zone, if you like, as shown in the yellow in that diagram there, which is from Bob Lennon's review paper in 2012 in Elements. That's a, a nice idea and it undoubtedly works in some areas. But it's also clear that it doesn't always work. Not every lithium enriched pegmatite is carefully positioned around a parental granite. It's one of those models that is very much an N member where there's a few places that it actually works properly. The second model, and one that's kind of becoming much more important nowadays, is, um, is the idea that if you have metasedimentary rocks that are rich in lithium, you know, they might be um, the equivalents of Thacker Pass that formed uh, hundreds of millions of years ago and have since been metamorphosed, for example. Those kind of metasedimentary rocks, if they melt, they are very likely to produce uh, granitic melts that will be very lithium enriched and that that may be another way in which you can form pegmatites. And it is becoming clearer that this is certainly one of the alternative ways in which some lithium enriched pegmatites do form. And that's important, of course, for exploration models, because if your exploration model says to explore for pegmatites, you have to go and look for a granite, you're not necessarily going to find the ones that are formed by, by the second alternative method, which we think about as just crustal partial melting. So I won't go into that in more detail, but it is still an interesting area where there's a lot of research going on. And then the thing about pegmatites that is really important is the mineralogy. Uh, and of course, each pegmatite contains a range of different minerals in different proportions. That's 
the same as so many different types of ore deposit. You've got your ore minerals intergrown, of course, with gang minerals like quartz and albite. But when it comes down to lithium mineralogy, it really impacts what you're actually going to be able to do with that lithium. So if your pegmatite contains spodumene, uh, then of course that's the most important lithium ore mineral for batteries. Uh, we can um, extract spodumene, it's well known how to process it, albeit much of the processing technology is in China, and it's relatively enriched in lithium. If you've got petalite, uh, which is another lithium aluminosilicate with slightly less lithium in the mineral. It may often be used for ceramics rather than being processed for batteries, at least at the moment. And then you might have one of this range of other rather unusual minerals, eucryptite, lipidolite, and bligonite, which is a phosphate. Some of these are quite rich in lithium, but at the moment we don't have commercial scale processing methods to actually extract the lithium from those minerals and generate lithium hydroxide, for example, to go into the battery supply chain. So you knowing the mineralogy of your pegmatite is, is critically important, in fact, uh, when you're looking at exploring for lithium, and often not something that's necessarily reported. There is a quite a tendency to report lithium grade and not talk about which minerals it's in. And of course, pegmatites might contain other raw minerals like columbite tantalite for tantalum, cassiterite for tin, and polysite for cesium in differing amounts and often in differing zones. So understanding all of this is important. And we'll come back a little bit to some detailed research on lithium mineralogy later. And then of course, lithium supply chains, and most of you will be very aware of this. Um, the supply chain, the value chain starts with exploration, extraction, but then you've got to beneficiate, you've got to process, you've got to, in the case of lithium, You've got to uh, generate lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide before it can then go into manufacture of the components you need for battery cells, uh, before those can be used, uh, before you might finally get to recycling. And I think certainly a lot of the media are completely unaware of some of these intermediate steps, particularly the processing. It's almost the way it can be discussed, it's as though, uh, well, we're just going to mine lithium and that will be fine. And of course, for lithium, most pegmatite mines will have beneficiation on site, and then they will export a spodumene or petalite or lipidolite mineral concentrate, which commonly from most countries, and certainly from many African countries, will be exported overseas for further processing and manufacture, generally to China, with much of the manufacture in China, Japan, South Korea. All of that, of course, means that you've got uh, a whole supply chain that has significant environmental impacts, which is potentially an issue uh, in terms of thinking about batteries, electric vehicles, and reducing CO2 emissions. So life cycle analysis is, is really raising and becoming very important for this. We've got a paper in press in Nature Reviews, Earth and Environment on life cycle analysis for the battery raw materials. So having put all of that kind of context around it, let's look at some of the lithium resources in Africa. Uh, what's there, what it's being used for at the moment, and what's developing. And we'll start in Zimbabwe, because Zimbabwe is the, is the jewel in Africa's crown in terms of lithium resources. It is also a challenging country in which to work, a very difficult political and economic environment. But it is the only country in Africa that is currently producing lithium from the Bakita mine. Uh, and it has several other pegmatites with lithium resources, including Arcadia, which is near Harare, Kamativi in the West and Zulu, and several other smaller pegmatites. Now, geologically, most of Zimbabwe is Archean Craton, uh, with Archean Nisus shown in pink and the greenstone belts and dark green in that map. Uh, but to the north and south, it has areas of younger Proterozoic mobile belts. Uh, and most of the pegmatites are in the greenstone belts in the Archean Craton, so the same kind of context as pegmatites in Australia. But uh, Kamativi is something much younger. It's actually more like the pegmatites of Namaquiland on um, the South Africa Namibia border. So Zimbabwe's had two major episodes of lithium pegmatite formation in its geological history. This is Bakita. It's Africa's only producing lithium mine. It's been mined since 1910. So it was originally mined for tin. At times it's produced, um, it's produced tantalum, it's produced cesium, and it's produced lithium. 
Uh, and it's a pretty major pegmatite. The bottom photograph there shows you very nicely the, uh, the sharp margin of the pegmatite against the country rocks. And it's producing lithium, but what it's actually producing is petalite, which is sold for ceramics. Bikita hasn't, I was there in January of last year, just before the lockdown, and Bikita hasn't actually produced any lithium that goes into battery supply chains so far. But it does have uh, potential resources of spodumene, uh, and in fact, the reserves that are currently worked are not, being, uh, are not public. There's no figures that are public but they have identified a spodumene resource of 13 million tonnes at greater than 1.6% lithium oxide. So they have made, they have started putting out more information about that, but they're not yet working for spodumene. In fact, last I heard from Bikita, it was on care and maintenance, but uh, I don't know the details now. And they have very irregular zonation. So they have some areas that spodumene rich, some that are petalite rich, some that are lipidolite rich, and the lipidolite rich bits also have tantalite in them. And then some pockets that contain polycyte, which is uh, mined and sold for cesium. So really complex pegmatite mined across a string of open pits. And some beautiful classic pegmatite textures. Uh, we it took a long while to get our samples out in Zimbabwe. So we've only started working on them relatively recently. And in terms of its geological history, the Kita is Archean in age. It's been dated at about 2,600 million years, which is a pretty classic age for pegmatites in Archean cratons. Now, Arcadia, uh, which is owned by Prospect Resources. Arcadia has only been explored since 2016. Uh, prior to that, there really wasn't much written about it at all. It's very close to Harare, and there was a small old pit there, which you can see in the top photograph. Uh, their DFS came out in 2019, and they announced um, Southern Africa's largest drought compliant lithium reserve. You can see the figures there. It's a set of stacked flat-lying pegmatites. It contains petalite and spodumene. Again, in, in fact, at the moment, the petalite is what's driving the value of this, but there is spodumene there as well. And it's likely Archean in age, we don't yet have a date. In fact, we don't yet have much detail at all in the public domain uh, on Arcadia. But Arcadia is the project that really is developing at the moment. And that bottom picture was sent to me yesterday. And this is their trial mining underway. So this is actually the first time we've seen new um, development and opening up of a pegmatite at Arcadia. And they have a pilot plant that was completed in June 2021, opened by the president of Zimbabwe, uh, which will produce petalite concentrate. So this is a project that is really moving forward at the moment, but not at the moment planning to supply anything into the battery supply chain either. That's petalite it's going to produce for ceramics. And then the third um, locality in Zimbabwe is Kemativi. And this was a major tin mine, mined for tin 1936 to 1994. Um, and the top right picture is in the, the pit of the tin mine. Lithium was never extracted. And so it's there in the tailings and the bottom picture shows you the, the tailings pile at Kemativi. And spodumene is the main lithium mineral there. So the, the resource that's been uh, developed by Zimbabwe Lithium in partnership with, um, with Zimbabwe companies uh, is in the tailings piles, uh, principally, because that's the most accessible lithium resource. But this is an area where there's, there's lots of pegmatites, there's lots of potential for lithium, and the main pegmatite is about a billion years old, a lot younger than anything else in Zimbabwe. So, um, yeah, lots of potential uh, at Camera TV to make use of those tailings. Uh, which, of course, if it was in Europe, they'd, everyone would be getting very excited about, but it's uh, perhaps less relevant in Zimbabwe. If we go to West Africa, then Ghana and Mali are the countries where there's a lot of interest at the moment. But actually, the Beremian Belt of West Africa, which is the Paleoproterozoic Belt that, of course, many of you will know is particularly of interest for gold. Uh, within that belt, there's also lithium pegmatites at several localities. And the two that are most developed are Iwoya and Ghana, which is Iron Ridge Resources. They've got a drought compliant resource um, and they're partnering with Piedmont Lithium. And these two photographs are from Iwoya. Uh, the bottom one in particular, those kind of long, almost feathery looking crystals are spodumenes. Uh, so this is you know, pretty substantial uh, spodumene crystals visible just in samples of the pegmatite there. 
Gulamina in Mali, Firefinch, but they have a JV with Gamfeng Lithium, which of course is important, Gamfeng being one of the biggest lithium companies. And they have very substantial, again, drug compliant reserves and a wider resource. And in both of these pegmatites, spodumene is the main lithium mineral. Uh, and so if they start producing, they may well be able to supply the battery supply chain. But at the moment, both are still in development, although, although moving fairly rapidly. And then there's Namibia. Uh, and in Namibia, we've got two companies uh, that are really interesting, Afritin Mining and Lipidico Afritin holds the Wish Tin Mine and they are currently mining tin. So their lithium uh, would be a byproduct and that's chiefly petalite. So their resource estimate is, is dominated by the tin, but they have potential to be producing lithium. And that's the Caribbean pegmatites, Rubicon and Helicon pegmatites uh, shown on the right there. And this is the project that Lipidico holds. And um, Lipidico is, is a, an interesting company because it's a bit more vertically integrated. So at Caribib, the main lithium mineral is lipidolite. Lipidolite is a lithium mica. It's currently not being commercially processed anywhere. But Lipidico has developed proprietary processing technology uh, to obtain lithium from lipidolite. And so they are planning to mine lipidolite at, to mine the pegmatites at Caribib export the um, lipidolite concentrate actually to the United Arab Emirates where they plan to build a processing plant. That's their proposal. These pegmatites are much younger than any of the others we've talked about. They're only about 500 million years old. So, you know, young, really. Certainly young by uh, African standards. And yeah, those are some of the most advanced um, deposits in Africa. But um, there are plenty of other countries, and I must mention the Monono mine in the DRC. Uh, again, this has been exploited for tin and is now being explored for lithium by AVZ Minerals Limited with some Congolese companies. And I, the only reason that I haven't given them a separate slide is because I haven't unfortunately been lucky enough to go there and I don't have uh, any photographs. And we are waiting for samples, in fact, from AVZ Minerals. But there's a whole host of other countries that have lithium pegmatites and could have future resources. Uh, there's a report there that we've released recently that summarizes a bit more detail on the various resources in Africa. Um, and definitely yeah, go and have a look at that uh, if you're interested. And this is the summary resource table from that report. And I think you can say fairly clearly, uh, you'll note that all of these resources have been um, announced in the last three years. And you can see that even just taking the lithium resources that exist that are known across Africa, there's a substantial amount of, of lithium there. And this is only one continent. So it's just a reminder that scarcity of lithium is really not an issue. So just um, I'd like to sort of finish off with a bit of discussion about mineralogy, because I said how important it was. And I'd like to give you a bit of information on kind of what we're working on, on trying to understand lithium pegmatite mineralogy. So David London is, is one of the fathers of pegmatite work along with Peter Cerny. And he did a lot of experimental work uh, in the 1980s and defined phase relations uh, that showed which minerals you would expect to get depending on the pressures and temperatures at which your pegmatite was in place. And essentially, you can see that petalite at lower pressures, uh, you're likely to get petalite um, and spodumene typically at higher pressures. But what was expected to happen was that often you would have um, formation of uh, petalite at the temperatures at which uh, pegmatites were in place. And that as they cooled, so they remained at about the same pressure, but they cooled, you would uh, go through into spodumene. So you would start having as in this picture that I show here from Arcadia, you would start having pecolite that was being replaced by spodumene and quartz intergrowths, often around its margins. Uh, and what we've seen more recently is that uh, some pegmatites form in that pecolite field. So you get pecolite forming as the initial lithium mineral. Some pegmatites form in the spodumene field. Uh, and so you get spodumene as the initial lithium mineral. And all of that makes reasonable sense, you know, it's uh, all pretty clear and 
understandable. And one of the questions is, does that mineral energy vary with age? Certainly, it seems as though the oldest pegmatites, like Bikita and Arcadia, formed in the Archean, uh, contain a lot more petalite, which may be indicative of them having formed at higher temperatures. Uh, and then as you come into the Proterozoic, you start seeing uh, spodumene as the dominant primary lithium mineral. And that may be indicative of them forming at slightly lower temperatures or at different pressures. And certainly the examples in Namibia, which are the youngest reef and caribou up here, are, are very variable in their mineralogy. So we're looking more at those controls on mineralogy. But that's your primary lithium mineralogy that may be explainable by pressure and temperature looking at the geological history. But it's more complicated than that. And I think this is the really important thing in terms of exploration. And this is the detailed paragenesis. And this paragenesis diagram we show here is from the CAMTV pegmatite in Zimbabwe. This is from a paper that's currently in review with the Canadian mineralogist. But the same type of paragenesis is being increasingly recognized in pegmatites around the world, both in Africa, there's recent papers on um, Mali uh, pegmatites and on the pegmatites in DLC, but also, for example, pegmatites in Ireland and in Spain and Portugal. And what we see really commonly is that you have stage one, you have the formation of your initial lithium minerals, uh, spodumene in the case of, of Kama TV, it might be petalite as well, along with quartz and alkali feldspar and a couple of other minerals, tourmaline, for example. Then you start seeing that the pegmatite, this kind of hot crystallizing magma, starts to really stew in its own juices. So you're seeing high temperature hydrothermal alteration. And what you start seeing is that you get breakdown of your primary lithium minerals. You have an introduction of albite and muscovite. And along with that comes your cassiterite, so your tin minerals, and your columbite group minerals, your colum columbite tantalite, your, basically your coltan for tantalum. And uh, you start seeing potentially growth of other lithium minerals, lower temperature lithium minerals, but you start losing that really good, easily uh, processable lithium mineralogy. And the image on the top right is a SEM phase mapping. And in this, um, now I have got things on my screen that stop me from seeing this really clearly, but I think I'm right in saying that the purple there is, is muscovite and you get intergrowth of muscovite, albite and quartz replacing a lot of your primary minerals, you start seeing real alteration of your spodumene. Spodumene in this diagram is in red, and there's really not very much of it left because you start getting, this is, this is really stage three. This is where you have extensive muscovite growing along with quartz, along with albite, that kind of thing. And when you get to very low temperature alteration and weathering, you get even more breakdown in lithium minerals and you get growth of clays and zeolites and all sorts of other things. And what happens to the lithium during these different stages, and whether it's actually lost from the rock, we, we don't really know yet. There's still a lot more research to be done on that, but certainly your, your easily processable lithium minerals are lost. So understanding this paragenesis, and understanding uh, which pigmentites are most likely to be easiest to process, is so important as a, an aspect of exploration. Just having a lithium grade is not really enough. And in fact, also, having a lithium grade is, uh, you know, is challenging for us as researchers. There's not a lot of bulk rock geochemical data out there. Often it will be just lithium grade, but actually we want to understand about more of the different elements to try and understand that geochemical picture a bit better. And this is a diagram from our forthcoming Hammer TV paper. And basically we've taken what data we could find in the literature to compare with our camera TV data, not much. The triangle, the diamonds are granites, the triangles are what's normally described as barren pegmatites. And then in circles, we've got mineralized pegmatites. And we're plotting lanthanum over tantalum versus magnesium over lithium. And the really key point here is, here are your mineralized pegmatites. They are pretty much always going to be high in tantalum and low in, in, low in lanthanum. So the rare earths are low in all of these mineralized pegmatites, the lithium enriched pegmatites. But whether they have enrichment in lithium or not is quite variable. So some pegmatites that are rich in tantalum will simply not be rich in lithium. 
And that's probably because of that mineralogy, because we're looking at this paragenesis where your lithium minerals may start to break down during the alteration in which the tantalum and tin are being introduced. There's much more to understand there to try and really get, get our heads around you know, the difference between lithium and tantalum enrichment and pegmatites and how that evolves and what the causes of that are. But it's all critically important, of course, for exploration. So that leads me to some conclusions. Uh, Africa's, you know, the continent is really interesting for lithium. There's several countries with lithium resources and pegmatites, and there are more to be discovered. And I say there are more to be discovered because, you know, I've, I've seen that that's the case. These pictures at the bottom, this is my colleague Richard Shaw in Sierra Leone. And those little boulders in among somebody's crops uh, on an area that was being explored for gold, those are spodumene pegmatites. And the, the picture to the left is the image with the sort of yellowish crystal that's optical cathodoluminescence. That's a spodumene crystal that's been weathered because we took samples right from the surface, but it's otherwise quite a fresh and unaltered spodumene crystal. And this is a lithium deposit that's completely unknown. All we know is there's some boulders with spodumene in it and there's been no further exploration. So it's pretty good evidence that there's more to be discovered. But there's a number of projects already progressing towards mining. And a really key point for me is the, the importance of lithium mineralogy. The lithium grade is one thing, but if you have good, fresh, clean, unaltered spodumene, that's going to be perfect for the battery supply chain if it's low in impurities like iron. But if you've got petalite, well, actually, you're probably going to supply it into the ceramics industry. And if you've got lapidolite or eucryptite or amplicanite, are you going to be able to process it at all? So understanding that mineralogy and understanding that pyrogenesis are, are vital parts. And this is where we as researchers at the BGS are able to um, kind of work, if you like, in tandem with the exploration companies and hopefully provide some information that's very useful to them in understanding how these lithium pegmatites form. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. That was um, yeah, so interesting. So thank you for sharing that. Um, but yeah, there was um, what age dating method would have been used for the Bikita figure is the plus minus a million a typical standard deviation. Yeah, um, so this is interesting. So of course, uh, so this is this is mostly work done by Frank Melcher and his group. And um, they haven't, of course, the way you want to date igneous rocks is uranium lead in zircon, uh, because zircon is the, the mineral that doesn't take up much lead when it's formed. And so it's really quite easy to date. But very few lithium enriched pegmatites have much zircon in at all. Uh, and so what we have to usually try and do is either date the coltan, the columbite tantalites, or date the cassiterite. Both of those are a bit harder to date. So it is uranium lead dating on coltan that we see. Uh, and actually the plus or minus one million year figure sounds quite optimistic to me. I would say that normally it's quite challenging to get that kind of precision on a date from a pegmatite. Uh, they're not easy things to date, but and that's partly why so many of them don't have um, ages associated with them. But we are working on it, the lab's working on it now, recognizing this is really important. And I think dating of the minerals in pegmatites is gonna improve pretty fast over the coming years. Yeah. Can we electrify the airline industry and international shipping, which account accounts for 90% of global trade and how? So why weren't the battery makers able to do that? <laughs> it's a really interesting question that as a geologist, I can't answer, but I did hear somebody um, so an expert talking about this recently, and they said, yeah, aviation is probably going to be the last. Obviously, there has been, I think in Norway, there's been some electric planes flying very recently, some test flights. But yeah, they said the aviation industry and shipping are likely to be one of the last holdouts of fossil fuels. And of course, there's a lot of enthusiasm about hydrogen here in the UK. We've just had a hydrogen strategy published. And of course, that's something that, again, needs geologists to understand um, you know, how to generate hydrogen, but more importantly, how to store it. Uh, so yeah, there's another whole kind of interest for geologists there in hydrogen, but yeah, not my expertise, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. How much lithium is there in seawater and in what form? 
Ah, yeah, now that is a good question. And we had an article out in Battery Bits on this recently, and I've forgotten the number, but lithium is there in seawater, no doubt about it. I, I can't remember the numbers, sorry. It's low concentrations, but there's a lot of seawater. Um, and it can be either just in the ionic form or it can be held in salt. Um, were we able to you know, extract the lithium from seawater as part of desalination plants? That would probably be fantastic. And maybe that's a technology that might develop in the future. But this is part of the point really of lithium not being scarce. You know, it is there in seawater. But yes, um, if anyone wants to drop me a, drop me a line through the BGS website, you can email me or anything. I can check the details of that if you're interested. Awesome. In terms of exploration, especially within Australia, depth of regolith cover is always a concern and the weathering process is such an important part of the cycle to understand, to explore for lithium enriched pegs. What sort of regolith depths are being encountered in Africa? Yeah, so this is a brilliant question and, um, and I think so important because, of course, lithium is very easily leached uh, by weathering. Um, and especially if it's, you know, if you've already had breakdown by hydrothermal alteration, you are going to lose the lithium if it's already sitting in things like zeolites and clays, uh, and it's going to be lost into the groundwater. And I, in Ghana, so um, the Iron Ridge Resources Project in Ghana is in an area, of course, of pretty heavy tropical weathering. And talking to them on the ground, they said they have 40 metres of tropical weathering before you really get down into... Uh, pegmatites where you can actually see the primary minerals and they said that soil sampling often doesn't show them any lithium at all because the lithium has been completely lost into the groundwater and their exploration has had to be based on the fact they had uh, some historical information in the area about uh, there being lithium in pegmatites in sort of adjacent areas that have been mined and they had to go looking for muscovites so big books of muscovite lying on the surface that would be indicative of pegmatites and analyze those. And even then you've often still lost the lithium. So you have to go on really at surface, you have to go on very piecemeal evidence if you don't have previous information uh, or if, you know, in areas of tropical weathering. And yeah, then they drilled and, uh, and they recognize that there are lithium pegmatites, but you have to go down 40 meters to find them. So that, yeah, it's really interesting. Tropical weathering is a, is a significant issue, no doubt about it. Yeah. And what are the geological settings which are favorable favorable for any lithium mineralization between the two granite parent and sedimentary melting um, that you mentioned in the presentation? This this is the million dollar question, <laughs> I would say, uh, which I cannot answer, but which there's a lot of research going on to try and investigate. Uh, interestingly, I think. If you look at some of the descriptions of some of the biggest and most important lithium rich pegmatites around the world, you cannot find a clear evidence of a parental granite of the same age. Uh, but some people have said, well, because the model is pegmatites come from parental granites, the parental granite must be buried at depth. So if you say, well, there could be something five kilometers down that we don't know about, that allows you to kind of get away with everything, you know. Um, I would say there are some lithium enriched pegmatites that are clearly related to parental granites, but there are lots that aren't. Wow. That's the best I can do to answer that question at the moment. Um, ask me again in 10 years. Hopefully we'll have a better answer then. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for coming on today. I appreciate you taking the time.